for joining us online today. At Convergence SD, we envision a place where the people of God converge with the purpose of God in establishing the kingdom of God. We'd love to hear how He's doing that in your life. So take a second and shoot us an email at info at convergencesd.com. Let us know how this ministry is impacting your life. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online at convergencesd.com or simply text your gift to 619-344-8454. I love it. I love it. I love it. Let's go tell the news. Kids are so uh, encouraging and full of joy and exciting. And we have an incredible kids ministry that uh, are, are hanging out with our kids right now and are going to do an Easter egg hunt uh, in just a little bit as soon as we're done here. We had an incredible time yesterday uh, here at the park, yeah? Yeah, so proud of all of you and those that were here yesterday helping us with uh, the Easter egg hunt um, and the, all the stuff that was going on. We served um, like 700 hot dogs, I think, we gave away and uh, we had... Uh, I don't know how many eggs they had, but they had, there were probably about two or 3,000 people here yesterday, which was pretty amazing, um, and we got to be a part of it. There was a lot going on, and so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It was Easter egg hunt. There was face painting. I don't want to forget the face painters that did a great job painting faces yesterday. Um, there were lost kids and lost parents. <laughs> thank you, Cassandra, for helping us find a lost parent yesterday. Um, bounce houses, fire trucks. Parents stealing eggs from kids. <laughs> Parents stealing food until they realized it was free anyways. <laughs> and like, oh yeah, I knew that. Tons of, tons of photos and tons of horse poop from the pony rides. My dad, I'm going to give it up for my dad who volunteered. He volunteered to go and be the pooper scooper after the horses yesterday, which is great. And we needed it, so... So yeah, so if you have kids, you know the joys of being a parent. Um, but guess what? Those kids, they're going to remember this for the rest of their lives. Days like today, days like yesterday, um, they're going to remember it for the rest of their lives. I have four boys from 14 to 5, and uh, Stacy and I have found ourselves talking a lot lately about... Yes, he's 14. Uh, talking a lot about... Uh, the kind of joys of parenting and, and raising our kids and deciding, okay, how do we raise our kids? And, you know, we're talking about different things, like about how to teach them about deodorant and shaving. and Because um, they're all boys, so we're going to be doing with that. And um, haircuts, you know, a lot of different things. Uh, here are just a list of a few things. Um, haircuts to house rules, right? Uh, public school to private school. And in between, we've done all three of those. We've done public school, we've done charter school, we've done private school. And so, you know, we're, we're having a lot of discussions about that. Um, their diets to dating, to airsoft, <laughs> paintball, allowances, all that kind of stuff that you have to uh, navigate as a parent. Sports to screen time to special events. Would you let them go on? Would you not let them go on? And, uh, you know, we don't, we don't always agree, you know, contrary to popular belief. Stacy and I, you know, we disagree every once in a while. And uh, we have to, to figure out, you know, how are we going to raise our kids? Because we learn a lot from how we're raised. We learn a lot from our parents. The, the things that you believe today about your faith and about what's right and about what's wrong and about ways that you should live your lives and some of the things I even just discussed are in large part determined by the way you were raised, by how your parents raised you, both good and bad. You know, I, I, I want to do it this way because my parents always did it this way. Or I want to do it that way because my parents always did it the other way. And I want to try something different. Like, we learn a lot and are, are shaped in large part by the way we are raised um, from our parents and the things that we believe to be true or not to be true. So how are you raised? Do you remember? You know, what about discipline, sports? What about you? Schooling, dating, church. I don't know, I don't know about you, but I didn't um, grow up in the church. My wife did. I didn't, and so we, we differ there a little bit. Uh, I, I do remember um, when, I was, when I was young, I do remember going to church. My parents tell me I was baptized when I was seven. Um, I don't really remember that, but what I do remember about church, a little presby Presbyterian church, right, in, uh, in, uh, in a small town, Medicine Lodge, Kansas, 
in the Midwest. How many people were in that town, Mom and Dad? 3,000 3, at the time when we were there. 3,000 people in the town. Um, just so you know, this kind of surrounding area here that we are kind of uh, trying to reach in this area is about 60,000 people in this area. And so 3,000 is a lot smaller. Um, I've been at churches larger than that. And so um, I do remember kind of a few things. I remember the pews in the church, mostly like sitting underneath them and looking at the gum and whatnot. For some reason, I remember dentine gum. I think my dad always carried it like in his pocket, probably just to keep us quiet. I remember drawing on the bulletins. I remember, um, I remember sitting in, a, in like a small group for, for kids and learning about Jonah the whale. I don't know why, but I remember that. Um, I also remember playing Red Rover in the, in the grass. Anybody play Red Rover? That's the most dangerous and crazy game ever. I mean, that's how arms get broken and dislocated. And like, I don't know where, whoever came up with that game. Crazy. Um, I remember this for some reason. I remember uh, getting on a bus and going to the circus. I have no idea what that had to do with church. But when I think about church, I remember that as an experience. And so these are the things that have shaped my faith over the years. The circus, Red Rover, Dentine Chewing Gum. I remember um, when we moved to, actually I don't remember a lot of this, but I remember moving to San Diego and we, um, we joined a church here. And then I remember the, the leaders, so the story goes, came to my parents and said, hey, um, we're going through a church split. We need to know what side you're going to be on. And my parents said, neither. And they left. And so we stopped going to church around that time. I was about eight years old, seven or eight years old. Stopped going to church. And so I uh, didn't have a lot of church growing up um, after that. But I do remember we kind of, at that point, we became what is I affectionately call now creasters. Right? Christmas and Easter. People that come to church on Christmas and Easter only. And so that was us. We were Christmas and Easter only people. And so I remember going to uh, Arizona. Our family lived in Arizona. I remember going to Easter service there. And it was there that I heard the gospel. And I heard the story of Jesus hanging on the cross for my sins. And I remember the, the pastor describing um, his death on the cross. And I remember being broken hearted. And, and weeping over, over this, this truth. And I had to leave the room because I was, I was weeping. And then we came back to San Diego and, you know, like I said, Christmas and Easter, we kind of went to church here and there or whenever. And then uh, when I was 20 years old, I made a decision. I remember going to church and making a decision. It was then that these tales, right, that we had heard in church, that you hear from time to time in church, uh, maybe in your family uh, raising, they, they told you stories about Jesus, these tales about Jesus in the Bible, and I remember at that time is when those tales became truths in my life. I believed them. I accepted them. They became part of my life. I said, if this is true, then I'm going to dedicate my life to serving God. If he did that for me, what can I do for him? And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about a time when the tales that you have heard about Jesus and about God become truths in your lives. And we see that in Scripture. We're going to be in Luke. Um, we're going to be in a, a few chapters of Luke, jumping through uh, 22 through 24. Um, and we're going to see where these tales that Jesus was telling his disciples became truths in their life. And so all the experiences that I had growing up and that you had growing up, both good and bad, are a huge part of your faith journey. And I wonder what faith journeys you've experienced? What does your faith journey look like over the years? In fact, that's what church is all about, remembering, remembering what God has done in our lives and the things that we have learned in our lives. That's why we gather every single day, not just today, but to remember who we are and why we were created. It helps us to keep our commitments to God and to one another, or better stated, it helps us remember God's commitment to us. The reality is that we all have to make a decision at one point in our life about what we believe, and that commitment shapes who we are. And you've obviously made a decision to be here today to remember Jesus. And I don't know if you came on your own volition or someone drug you here, or if uh, you just, maybe you're like we were, maybe you're a priest and you just came on, on Easter 
Um, but look what God did with me. Look what God has done. And so, um, a friend was in front of me coming out of church one day. The, those giggles of those people that know what's coming next. <laughs> it's, it's time for the joke. So a friend was in front of me coming out of church one day, and the preacher was standing at the door, as he always did, to shake their hand. He grabbed my friend by the hand and pulled him aside, and the pastor said to him, You need to join the army of the Lord. My friend replied, I'm already in the army of the Lord, pastor. The pastor questioned him and said, Well, how come I don't see you except at Christmas and Easter? He whispered back, I'm in the secret service. <laughs> hey. Secret service. Secret service. So regardless of what brought you here today, no Easter service would be complete without re- recounting the story of the resurrection. We're remembering the resurrection. But did you know that before uh, the death and resurrection of Christ... Jesus and the disciples were actually remembering the death and resurrection of something else. It goes all the way back to the book of Exodus. If you have your Bibles, we'd love for you to, to follow along with us in chapter 12 of Exodus, where we're going to start and we're going to jump to Luke uh, chapter 22. But uh, Exodus chapter 12, um, there's a story about uh, the death and resurrection of something else. The death and resurrection of the nation of Israel. If you remember the story of, of Joseph and before that, um, and Joseph, you know, remember he was put, put in prison, and then he became, you know, second in command out of prison. He became second in command of Egypt, the most powerful nation of the time. And so there was this prosperity amongst uh, the Israelites living amongst the Egyptians during that time because of Joseph's leadership. But then Joseph died. And along with him, the favor of God for Israel and the favor of Pharaoh for Israel died in that moment. And they really, as a nation, kind of became, they became slaves to to the Egyptians. And there was all kinds of persecution until, until a point where they cried out to God once again and said, God, please save us. Please resurrect us as a nation. And if you know the story, you've seen the movie The Prince of Egypt, one of my favorite movies of all time. You see the story of, really, the resurrection of the nation of Israel. And how did he do it? He went up against Pharaoh himself. And he brought the ten plagues against the Egyptians. And I love this story. I remember when I was teaching sixth grade, I taught, um, you know, in a public school, sixth grade, and part of it is teaching the, uh, the, the world religions. And so, of course, you know, Judaism was one of them. So I love teaching Judaism, and then I would teach uh, Christianity right after it, and they fit so well together because they're really one and the same. And so you take the story of the plagues, and what was the last plague that God brought upon Pharaoh in Egypt? The death of the firstborn son. Interesting. Firstborn son. Jesus being the one and only firstborn son of God. Interesting correlation there. And so the death of the first... And how did they... How were the the Israelites able to uh, not lose their firstborn son? They took the blood of a lamb, a pure spotless lamb, and they wiped it on the doorposts of their homes. And when the death angel came through Egypt, it would see the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and would pass over that house. And that's where they get the word Passover or Peshach. And that's what the disciples were celebrating. Let's read uh, Exodus chapter 12. It says, verse 13, it says this, The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you. And when I strike the land of Egypt, this day shall be for you a memorial day. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever. 
You shall keep it as a feast forever. Everyone say, forever. Forever. What movie is that from? Sandlot. Love that show. A statue forever. You shall keep it as a feast. So did you know that Easter was actually a Jewish holiday? It's, it's the Passover, this, the celebration of the Passover, of this very moment. And that's what the disciples were doing. They were remembering the Passover together with Jesus. And so skip over to Luke chapter 22. And I'm going to jump around a bit, so follow along if you can. Um, we're going to be in Luke the rest of the time here. But verse 7 of 22, it says, uh, says this, Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And that unleavened bread thing is a whole other thing. If you read in Exodus, you can read all about the unleavened bread and why they take unleavened bread. Any scholars in here know why they brought unleavened bread with them? Why did God tell them, you know, take the unleavened bread and put the blood on the lamb on the doorpost? Yeast symbolizes sin. Yes, yeast symbolizes sin. We know that today. But then it was simply, it was just a, a matter of good housekeeping. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't get, go bad because it didn't have yeast in it. And so they didn't know how long they were going to be in the desert. And so they took it with them. So the unleavened bread actually symbolizes the wandering of the desert. They're wandering in life. And wandering and wandering and wandering. Not sure where to go, but we know God's going to provide for us with unleavened bread. And so they had the unleavened bread, and this is the the day of unleavened bread. And so they would eat unleavened bread as a reminder of the Passover, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. And so Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. And skip down to verse 14. It says, And when the hour came, he reclined at the table, and the apostles were with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Remember, he had been with them for three years, and had told them time and time again about, hey, this is what's about to happen. What was his number one message? His number one message to the disciples and all those around him was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is about to be established. Because just like in the time of Egypt, the Israelites or the Jewish nation were being oppressed by the Romans during this time. And Jesus is saying, look, I've come to establish the kingdom of heaven, but it's not going to be like anything you've experienced before. And he says here, I want to I remind you of this time in Egypt. And he says, For I tell you, I will not eat it or the Passover meal until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And so he's saying, This idea of the kingdom of God is about to be fulfilled like you've never experienced it before, like you never thought it would be. I'm about to go to the cross and establish the kingdom of heaven in your hearts. And the kingdom will be wherever you go. So Jesus' primary message was repent for the kingdom of heaven is about to happen right here, right now. Verse 17, it says, And he took the cup, remember they're having the Passover feast, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it amongst yourselves, for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Once again, reference to the kingdom of God. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, referring to his death on the cross. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. You might want to underline that, has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them it would be, who was going to do this. And so this is probably Thursday during the week, right? This is Monday, Thursday, if you're, you know, if you have Catholic background, it's a celebration of the Passover. Um, And then Friday comes along, right? And he goes to trial on Friday and then he is crucified at about midday, it says, which is about 12 o'clock, right? Uh, What is it? The sixth hour. And so the Jewish time starts from, you know, sunrise to sunset. So the sixth hour would be about noon that he was crucified. And then, so skip down to verse 44. It was about the sixth hour, 12 o'clock. And there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. 
symbolizing now access to God, direct access. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And then we know the story. If you know the story, it goes on and they buried him in the tomb like we saw the story with, on the video. Uh, it's a beautiful paper tomb. Um, and then we pick up the story on the third day. And that's today. That's Sunday. So we had Thursday. We had Friday. Good Friday. That's what I call it. Good Friday. And then Saturday is in the tomb. And then Sunday, early Sunday morning, he's risen from the dead. That's what we're celebrating today. Verse 1 of chapter 24 says, But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember, I want to underline that word, highlight it. Remember, everyone say remember. Remember Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. You see, it was in this moment that these ladies who came to see Jesus in his tomb, it was in this moment that the tales that Jesus had told them about his death and his resurrection became truths. It was in that moment that they went from priesters to Christians. It was in that moment that they went from looky loos to loving disciples. Verse 10, Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Now you would think, I spent three years with Jesus He told them about what was going to happen. He did incredible miracles, you know, uh, feeding thousands with just a piece of bread and some fish. He, He rose people from the dead. Like, he did all these miracles. And you would think, having been told what was about to happen, that there would be no doubt when he rose from the dead that, oh yeah, this is exactly what he told us was going to happen. The kingdom of heaven is now. But yet, these disciples thought them to be idle tales. But Peter, on the other hand, says he went home marveling. It was in that moment that Peter, the one who had denied Christ three times, the one that Jesus had just referred to as Satan, get behind me, Satan, remember? This very same Peter went from doubter to fully devoted follower. He made the commitment from that very moment to be one of the most committed followers of Jesus that had ever lived. Eventually he was murdered for his faith. But it was in this moment that Peter made the decision to take the tales of Jesus and commit them as truths. So what about you? How do you see the stories in this book? Are they just fairy tales with a good moral point or Do you believe them to be truths? Truths that have the ability to transform your life. The story of Jesus and the resurrection, is it just a tale or is it a truth? If it's it's just a tale, then it's something you can talk about at the table and just kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, it's a good fairy tale story. But if it's a truth, it requires action on your part and on my part. If this really happened, if God really established the kingdom of heaven in our hearts, and we have access to it now through Jesus Christ, our lives should look different. It requires a commitment on our part. 
for those of us that believe it to be the truth, we're actually going to take a moment in just a minute to do exactly what Jesus told us to do, asked us to do. We're going to remember his death and his resurrection through communion. The Seder. That's not an exact representation of the Seder. We don't have a lamb and other, some other stuff, but it is the. Uh, we're not going to kill a lamb here today. That would be weird. Um, it's already. We don't have to. And a lot of people ask that question. Well, how come they don't slaughter lambs anymore? Well, it's because we don't do that because Jesus was the lamb. He was the Lamb of God, and His blood. Like, much like in Egypt, they, they slaughtered the lamb and put the blood on the doorposts of the homes. Jesus' blood now is wiped on the doorposts of our hearts. And that's the beautiful thing, because now when, when God comes along and it comes to judge all of humanity, what's he going to see? He's going to see the blood of Jesus on our hearts if we've, if we've accepted that. And he's going to pass over us with his judgment. What a beautiful thing. And that's what we're going to remember today. And that's why we're going to take of the bread, symbolic of Christ's body broken for us. And we're going to take of the juice, symbolic of Christ's blood shed for us. So we acknowledge Jesus. We acknowledge it and we, we accept him into our lives. His blood covers the doorposts of our hearts. In other words, he remembers the work of his son when he sees us and acknowledges it as payment for our sins, the sins of the world. And so for those of you that have taken the tales of Scripture and made them truths to live by, this will be your time to remember this tale and to remind yourself of the incredible work of God in your life and in the lives of those around you. But for some of us today, maybe, maybe today is your day to accept the tales of Scripture as truths to live by. Maybe today is your day to do what I did when I was 20 years old. I went from Christer to Christian and made a commitment to follow Jesus. And if that's you today, I want to just ask you to do three things for me, if you would. Number one, make an indication on your card. If you get a card or grab a card on your way out. Make an indication, say, hey, I made a decision to make Jesus the Lord of my life today. I accepted him as truth and not just an idle tale. And I want to follow him with all my life. Write that on your card. Put it in the, in the box in the back. We'd love to, to follow up with you on that. Number two, consider getting baptized. Next week, we're going to have a, a, a barbecue here, and I'm going to bring a, 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 a baptismal. It's just really a jacuzzi. But it's going to, we're going to we use it as a baptismal, and we're going to do baptisms right here in the park. And so if any of you have never been baptized before, let me encourage you to do that. And I can talk to you more about that. Um, it's not like you have to take five classes in order to get baptized. You just have to commit your life to Jesus and say, I want to tell the world that I'm a follower of Jesus now. That's it. And we can talk more if you have questions about that, but we're going to be ready to do that next week. And so if you've never been baptized, what a great opportunity to do that. And if today you're saying, I want to follow Jesus with all my life, that's your next step. Get baptized. And then lastly, number three, I want to encourage you to join us today as we take communion. So if you're a follower of Jesus and you want to remember the work of the cross today, we're going to do that by taking communion. Once again, the bread is symbolic of Jesus' blood. He said, take this and eat it in remembrance of me. And the blood is symbolic of Jesus' blood, or the, the juice is symbolic of Jesus' blood shed on the cross for us. And he said, take this drink in remembrance of me. Amen? Amen. I'm asked the worship team to come up as we continue in worship by taking up communion. And here's how we do it here. It's very simple. Um, it's really however you want to, during this next song, however you want to take communion. If you want to come and take it here, you want to take it off into a corner and pray and, and, and interact with God, feel free to do that. Maybe husbands want to serve your wives and your kids Feel free to do that. Um, but it's really up to you as the, as the Lord leads us during this time of worship, during this next song. Um, just feel free to come and take communion. And then uh, when the song's over, we'll have Eric come up and, and close us out. Let me pray for us. Father, thank you 
for the sacrifice that you made in giving your one and only son, your firstborn son. Thank you for that, God. And we pray this morning, Lord, that we could take the tales, the stories from your word and accept them as truth. Accept them as truths that will transform our lives today. Help us to do that. We're not always sure how to make that a reality. Lord, would you help us to do that? Would you surround us with other Christians that can help us along our journey? Help us to remember the stories that we were told as kids about your, about your life, about your death, about your resurrection. Stories from your word. But today, Lord, specifically, we want to remember not just your death, but your resurrection from the dead, showing that you have conquered death itself. And so would you, would you just bring to remembrance all of these great things as we take communion this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for joining us online today. At Convergence SD, we envision a place where the people of God converge with the purpose of God in establishing the kingdom of God. We'd love to hear how He's doing that in your life. So take a second and shoot us an email at info at convergencesd.com. Let us know how this ministry is impacting your life. If you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do so online at convergencesd.com or simply text your gift to 619-344-8454.